Hi. Okay. So it's uh, nine o'clock, and uh, it looks like we're actually all in the right place uh, for EdChat Interactive. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring the slides down here. Uh, this is our uh, second version, our conclusion of our uh, mystery about Lev Vygotsky. Let me bring up Jeff uh, Borden right here. Okay. Hi. So um, so you've been busy this last week. Uh, what what's been going on? Well, uh, it seems that everything is, I think, going to be all right. Uh, you guys all helped what was going on. I'll, I'll recap it for you tonight. But uh, I think I think we're going to be okay. I, I've got some visuals to kind of help us uh, get through it. Uh, just to let everybody know, for those of you who are not here, uh, Jeff uh, started off on Monday night and he was talking about some of the changes that have happened in the education system and what the purpose of the education system was, the U.S. education system, when we first got started uh, back in uh, the days of uh, President Woodrow Wilson. And he had been talking about how various um, intellectuals of the 1930s had gotten together, come up with a plan so that everybody would get a great start in education. Uh, that the lessons would be much more interesting, the kids would be more involved, the teachers would be really more motivated. Um, and he was in the process of revealing what happened when there was a knock on his door and he, um, and he fled. <laughs> so we've been trying to find clues as to what happened to Jeff and what happened to those mysterious papers for the last few days. So Jeff, have you emailed me the files yet? Or it is coming to okay. you right now. So it's going to take me a couple minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to come down off the screen, and maybe okay. you can just give a recap while I yep. run through stuff. Through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Let me let me talk about what's been going on. So, uh, again, thanks to all of you who were able to uh, help me figure out sort of this mystery as I went. Um, for those of you that were here on Monday night, I showed you a letter, and that letter. Uh, I actually uploaded to a board, a virtual board that I, I also gave you access to. And I, I appreciate those of you. It sounds like most of you got on that night. So thanks for that, for figuring out the riddle. I knew you could do it. Um, as soon as you got on that board and you saw that, that letter, you would have seen a letter that was seemingly very old. In fact, I've had it dated to uh, the late 1930s. And uh, it was a letter from someone in a strange educational organization back to their boss saying that they had confiscated the paper and that they had gotten it from. And it's interesting because in that, that document, um, they referred to different aspects of um, educational theory in different ways. And so I, I had come to the conclusion after having gone through it and, and really looked at it um, and tried to, try to find out kind of what some of the words were that on it. There was a couple of logos up in the upper left hand corner, things like that. I really came to believe that it might have been talking about Dewey, Piaget, and Vygotsky. And that paper, uh, that, that actually that letter about a paper, uh, I made me wonder, where's the paper? I, I wanted to, to start to find that paper. And so uh, what I did was I went off and I started to work on that project by myself uh, a lot at first. And then pretty soon I, I brought in a colleague of mine, uh, Greg Kunzweiler, who really did a great job facilitating and, and helping out uh, on Monday night after the weirdness took, took place. But essentially what I did with that paper that I, I uploaded to the, the board was it, uh, it led me to start to look in to Vygotsky, first of all, because I thought how odd that a paper by Vygotsky would be corralled by some sort of organization. And I happened across a blog by Vygotsky's granddaughter. And that blog uh, suggested that Vygotsky hadn't actually passed away in 1934 from tuberculosis, as most of the world believed. But in fact, she wondered if he had left the place and, and he was gone. Now, there a coffin there. There is a body there now, but she really didn't seem to believe that, that Vygotsky had actually died in, in 34. And so as I started to look at that and started to look around, I started to find documentation. I started to find 
uh, pictures. I started to find old logos that seemed to tie into that very same time. And interestingly, when I started looking up Vygotsky with Dewey or Vygotsky with Piaget, suddenly uh, documentation started to come out that I, I didn't think possibly could. I, I knew that they were contemporaries, but I realized that uh, Piaget visited the United States from 1934 to 1937. And some of you pointed out in the pictures that were on that board that uh, you can actually see these three men together. And that's what it seemed to happen. They actually uh, all got together in the United States. We now have photographic evidence that that happened. And you got to see that on the board. Uh, along with some strange happenings, there's a there's an interesting man in the back of the picture that uh, I, I know a lot of you noticed. And that man seemed to appear in other. There's a picture of him with Woodrow Wilson. There's a picture of him uh, standing outside of some sort of institution, and, and we're not exactly sure what he's doing. Well, we now know that that man uh, was actually a man named Maxwell Maxnew. And uh, Max knew it was one of those publishing moguls who brought in a lot of different uh, publishing things, a lot of different companies and stuff. He actually uh, had a company at one point, his last name mixed with uh, Sense, I believe, Sense Publishing that he had brought in. And so uh, Max knew Sense was uh, one of the giant conglomerates of the time. But at the same time, Max knew seemed to be very, very... Um, integrated with what was going on with Woodrow Wilson, with Rockefeller, with some of the other social engineers like Elwood Coverley and um, some of the people like Horace Mann and, and his whole concept around emulating the, the Prussian model of education. And Max New seemed to be in that same vein to the point where I started to wonder if Max New actually was, I don't know, a little nefarious. Maybe he uh, had something else that was going on uh, with regard to uh, all well sure enough uh, we started to put kind of two and two together and we figured out fairly quickly that Max New was had been put in charge of a an organization called the DIE the uh, Department of Instructional Enforcement and the Department of Instructional Enforcement was supposed to keep the rigidness of the education system and you saw those quotes from guys like Elwood Coverley who said the job of the school is to keep students afraid and to keep them feeling lonely and to make sure that the only comfort they have are the rigid lines of the desks and the bells that, that tell them to move from one place to the next place so as to keep their focus squarely on the front of the room so that the instructor can fill their head with knowledge and so as uh, as you saw those quotes from those men it seems that Woodrow Wilson hired Max New to enforce just that. And I would, I would argue that that enforcement has been going on ever since. The shadow organization inside the government has been um, trying to perpetuate this whole concept of, of how education should take place, at least according to these guys. And um, that's what actually led to some of the problems that I had the other night. So uh, I was say, literally... I say, yeah. I got your file. Okay, Thank and you. I've converted it to a PDF and I've loaded it so I can I can put it up here. I will say I had to use I had to create it as a um, reduced size PDF, so there may be a few graphics that are missing. Um, okay, I haven't looked at it yet, but uh, but I'll bring myself down and okay um, and bring the, bring the slides back up. Okay, great, great. So um, I uploaded in, and you'll see this here in a second a, a picture of myself trying to go out into the world and, and get some of this data. And the guy that actually accosted me the other night that was after me, I have photographic evidence of him on a class trip that I took to Switzerland when I was actually looking for some of the stuff from Piaget. Uh, he has been following me for, I think, about a year. And in one of the photos that, that you'll see here in just a moment, hopefully, um, he is lurking in the background and he seems to be trying to to see what I'm doing. And I've got pictures of him in Venice. Until I started assembling all of this together, he really has been following me around. Well, nonetheless, um, I was able to get to Washington. I found a piece of evidence 
Um, some of you found some evidence that was actually hidden on that blog from Vygotsky's granddaughter. Uh, he had been using a bookmark uh, inside of an old trunk, and some of you found it and 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 you know asked a great question: Why would a Russian have paper a paper that had been written English? And sure enough, it was the middle section of this summary that describes this paper that these three men worked on. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like the the summary and the paper were attempted to be destroyed. So we have the middle section from Vygotsky's granddaughter. Then uh, I was able to find the front or the top section from uh, one of my contacts that, that I, I had who was really a conspiracy theorist, and I thought he was a little off of his rocker, but he uh, provided me with some of the uh, information that was really quite fascinating. And then some of you once again came through and found the information tied to Max New, tied to the last of the paper, uh, out on some of the other sites that are, that are kind of out in the world. You were able to find some of the stuff that was on um, uh, Wikimedia Commons, and you were able to find some of the stuff uh, about not only Max New, but also the stuff on Marquid and some of the other information that led us to finally have all three pieces of the paper. And all three pieces of those paper are up on the Padlet site right now. So really, I, I can't thank you enough for all of your help uh, in, in getting me where, where I, I am today because I was able to meet with that presidential hopeful. And if he becomes he wants to nominate me for Secretary of Education, and I will take care of this. I will get rid of DIE. Uh, I will get rid of EVL. I will get rid of these shadow organizations trying to keep education down so that you and I can do the things that we know to be right and best for our students and our kids, and we can actually make a difference with them. So really, at the end of the day, thank you for all of your help and your support. All right. With that, I think I'll bring down the fourth wall. And uh, I, I want to go into a description of what we did here, uh, what worked, why I did some of the stuff I did, uh, what is true and what is not true. Uh, essentially, what we have done over the last 72 hours is we've played an alternate reality game. Some people call it an augmented reality game. But it essentially is where reality sits here and parallel to reality is the game. So you weave in and out of uh, what is real and what is not. Uh, um, but the idea in this case was to actually create not an ARG or alternate reality game as much as an ARLE, an alternate reality learning experience. And that's what I tried to do and, and tried to build here with a wonderful team behind me, uh, some of whom are in the room with us tonight. Um, this team really did a miraculous job putting this together in a relatively short period of time. They got it together in, a, in about five weeks or so. Um, and I want to go through how we built this game tonight because I really believe and what we were trying to show you was that you could create a game similar to this for your, your students and for their experiences. You could do it alone. You could do it with colleagues. Uh, you could do it uh, in all kinds of content, and I think really good things can come from it uh, as you go. All right. Um, as, as as you think about games and gamification, uh, I understand that, uh, first of all, what we did here was a little bit unusual in that we didn't tell you it was coming. Um, we didn't let you know that you were going to be part of a game. Now, that's typically how an ARG works. People start playing a game without knowing that they're playing. And I think our biggest fear from the team here was that somebody would call the actual police when they thought that I was being accosted by this weird person at my school. So I hope nobody did that. I don't, I don't think anybody did that. Uh, we tried to make it so cheesy and over the top that you would soon realize you were playing a game. But uh, you can actually start games with people that they don't know that they're playing. And because of the stigma that goes with games, Sometimes that's a pretty decent way in. People will get hooked in and start to uh, do things they wouldn't normally do if they thought that a game was involved. Now this is true of teachers. This is also true of students. There are it, it's it's a little bit uh, of a reach to say that all students like to play games. 
um, students who think that that stigma exists just like their parents might or their teachers might and that a game is nothing that and that they have more important things to do etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, there are times that playing game like things without calling them games is probably pretty important um, and that's what we did here we started the game kind of on our own so uh, Mitch if you could go on to the next page um, game based learning is something that has been around for a long time and has been studied for a very long time. And it, there are a lot of different frameworks and a lot of different ways that you can start to look at it. Uh, go on to the next page. But it's pretty hard to, uh, to suggest that games don't work. There's a very famous quote now by John Seeley Brown, who um, argued back in uh, 2014, I believe, that, the, that w World of Warcraft is actually better uh, for finding candidates than Harvard MBA students. And uh, when Harvard called and said, John, how can you say such a thing? What a, what a horrible thing to say. Uh, he said, no, they're doing all the stuff that your students are theorizing about. They are actually hiring. They're, they're bringing people to their band. They are training them. They are uh, firing. They're getting rid of people out of the band before the raid. They are leading. They are exhibiting all these skills. And they said, John, John, nobody do that. How can you say that? You went to Harvard. And John Seeley Brown said, well, I think you're wrong because that's how they hired one of the presidents of Yahoo. In fact, the, somebody who people still say is the, was the best president Yahoo ever had, they hired because of his game experience. So as you start to look at the world around us, uh, game theory and game elements really is starting to make a, a pretty big play. If you go to the next page, I do understand that there is a stigma with games. And so uh, I'd like to actually ask you just for a quick moment to indulge me in one game so that I can, I can kind of ex explain the difference between a good game and a bad game. If you could please, I would like you to imagine that you are on a ship that is going down and you've got 30 seconds to decide who among you gets put into a life raft. Now uh, I see... Uh, well, let's see. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Go ahead and get in groups. You can get into groups of up to five. And so the, the, the goal is this. After you're in groups of up to five, you, um, you have to decide which of you is not going to get in, into the life raft. And at 30 seconds, I'm going to say time's up, and you're going to have to raise your hand if you're the one not getting in the life raft. And I promise, if you don't get in the life raft, you're going to die. Okay? So group together, get in groups, and decide in 30 seconds which one of you is not going to get into the life raft. Go ahead. If you're not sure how to get into groups, click on somebody else's picture. There you go. And then if you're in twos, two people can, picture, can click on somebody else's, and then you can get into a group. There you go. All right, you've got about 20 seconds left. Ten seconds left. Five, two, one. All right, time. So uh, I can see one hand raised. If you were the person in your group who was voted out or decided to get out, raise your hand. There's a couple of hands going up. All right, so thank you, first of all, those of you that uh, didn't get in the raft, you took one for the team, well done. Now, there's an inherent problem with that game, and I don't even have to ask you what it is, you already know what it is. I'll go ahead and say it out loud. That game is stupid. That is a dumb, dumb game, you know it. Because you know you're not on a, on a, on a raft, you know you're not gonna die. And in fact, I would almost bet most of you, when I said, pick a person to get in the water and die, uh, I'll bet a lot of you just went, whatever, I'll do it, because you knew it wasn't real. It's, it's just that silly. That's not what I mean when I'm talking about a game. Uh, when I'm talking about a game, and Mitch, if you'll click to the next slide, I'm talking about games like Fold It. Fold It was created by scientists when, after 13 years of research, or almost actually almost 15 years of research, they could not figure out how a retrovirus protein replicated. They didn't understand how it duplicated itself. And so somebody finally had the idea after 15 years, they said, why don't we turn this into a crowdsourced experience so that others can try it so we can see what happens. 
Well, they turned it into a, this game called Fold It, and with, within two and a half weeks, gamers figured out the replication pattern. They figured out how it did it. And scientists believe that that is what will allow them to actually solve the AIDS puzzle, the AIDS crisis, because of games. Uh, Mitch, if you go to the next slide, the, the kind of games I'm talking about you see here in Enter Zon. Enter Zon is a game that teaches conversational Chinese. Uh, if you go into Zon, you will be dropped in the middle of virtual China, wearing nothing but a t-shirt and shorts, and you communicate over Skype for free with others in the game that speak Chinese by speaking Chinese. People are learning conversational Chinese in Zon in two or three months, when it normally takes them seven or eight months in a formalized setting. That's the kind of game I'm talking about. If you click the next slide, games actually create pattern finding. And pattern finding, if you look at John Medina's work out of Brain Rules, is something that is extremely healthy for our brains. It's very, very good in terms of how our brains can and should. The next slide will show that games are a really nice way to integrate curriculum together, to put disparate pieces of things that didn't seem to necessarily go together, together. I, I really quickly want to describe to you how I have um, come to this, this place where I have been playing uh, games like this, and I've been doing them in the classroom for quite quite a long time. The next slide will show you my very first alternate reality game, or really alternate reality learning experience, A-R-L-E as I like to call it. The very first time that I did it was at the University of Northern Colorado, and uh, I brought to bear a game for students to play around courtroom communication. We had students from uh, science who were involved. We had students from communication who were involved. We had students from journalism who were involved. And essentially what happened is, if you see in that picture, and then on the next slide you see another, uh, another group of pictures, those are pictures of me as a dead body. And at the opening moment of the class, I got murdered. And then for the rest of the two weekends of this class, the students had to try a person who was accused of committing that murder. And so the journalists covered the event. The communication students acted as the prosecution and the, and the, uh, the science students acted as forensics experts. We had people play jury members who did not see what had happened. And it really started me down this kind of foray into alternate reality gaming uh, a little over 20 years ago when I really started doing this as both a graduate student and then ultimately I took it on when I was teaching my own classes at UNC and at Metro State. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the next big uh, ARG that I, I, I undertook called Cheating 101. Those two horrifying pictures there are both of me uh, because we accused these two students of cheating. And uh, we used the experience to show teachers what kind of new ways of cheating were in the digital age and how you could take words and put them on the inside of a Dasani bottle uh, using a, a printer and then you can use that Dasani bottle to help you magnify the words and then you could cheat using that. And so we showed them all kinds of new ways that, that, that cheating went on and how to prevent it as well as how to think about it differently. Uh, the next slide will then show you the next big game that I played which was actually played out at my last company where I worked um, while I was teaching adjunct. We played a game in Australia and the United States, both in high school and in college. We unleashed Cajun on the earth. And we said what would happen in, uh, with, with the disciplines of science, business, political science, communication, and ethics if this contagion had actually been unleashed. Our science students had to figure out what it was. Was it a virus or was it a bacteria? The business students had to figure out uh, what it would do to the global economy and how they could slow or, or even stop some of the, the problems. Political science had to act as the government and determine if they were going to uh, quarantine the, the, their, their country or not, work with other countries, etc. Communication and ethics were constantly talking about what we should do or could do. And it really became a pretty powerful experience for those students that took place over the course of a semester and they interacted in, through a learning management system via the, across the oceans in Australia and the United States and across classrooms in California, Iowa. Uh, we, had, we had students in Texas. Um, they were all over the place. It was really a rich experience for those students. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. Both the high school and the college really did a tremendous job with it. 
The next slide shows one that we're actually doing right now at St. Leo University. Um, we are putting on a mock presidential debate. The, we have got uh, candidates coming out of our political science classes, and uh, they are. we have a Republican Party and a Democrat Party. They are working with the video production majors to air commercials and interviews. They're going to stream the live debate that's about to happen in two weeks. We've got uh, criminal justice majors who are making sure that the environment is safe. We have got psychology majors who are analyzing the candidates and their platforms to see if they're really connecting with others. We've got education. We've got social media and marketing involved. We've got um, communication involved. It's really a rich curriculum integration experience that is all based on alternate reality gameplay. And again, we're calling it an alternate reality learning experience. <coughs> and then finally, the next slide shows the game that we just played. The education machine. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting excited. Um, in terms of the education machine, we have got all of these things coming to bear where we were trying to show you about Vygotsky and Dewey and Piaget, about social learning. We wanted you to explore uh, education's history in the United States. We wanted to uh, show you what it was like to, um, to be a, a person back during the time of social engineering by Horace Mann and Elwood Coverley. Um, those quotes are completely true. They're, if you look them up, you'll find them as legitimate quotes in history. If uh, you look up the information about Wilson or Rockefeller, well, I don't think they created a shadow organization called DIE. Uh, they did say that they wanted a small group of ed the educated to be at the upper class, the upper echelon. They would run essentially the country. And they wanted the majority of people who were educated to come out as workers. And that's about it. And so if you start to look at what, what we were trying to get out of that, it was really a question about the inputs and the outputs because we haven't changed the inputs in education. But we very much expect different outputs in education. And so when you look at that, when the, when the system was architected in a very specific way, what does that lead to? So I've got some experience playing these kinds of games. And what I want to do now is, is show you how we put it together and, and how you could put yours together. Um, I want to say from the start, we put this together using all free resources. Uh, we tried to put them up on sites and boards that were free. We tried to use communication tools that were free um, because I realized that schools, districts, even individual teachers don't really have a budget. So we tried to put this together in a way that was uh, something that could be replicated by you. Now, basically what I've done is I've taken some of the work of Jane McGonigal, who's um, amazing in the alternate reality game, uh, game space, and I've tried to remix that for education. So I think, uh, I, I hope you'll see what, what I'm talking about. So if you look at the very first slide on how to create an ARLE, there's really two things you want to do at the beginning. You want to start a public team, and you want to research some game mechanics and determine what the roles will be for the people at team. Now, if you look at the next slide, there's some really places to start for, for learning about game mechanics. Uh, reality is Broken, uh, The Gamification of Learning and Instruction by Carl Papp, uh, Now You See It by Kathy and Davidson. Really good places to learn what game mechanics are. And there's, of course, lots of others out there. There's the SeriousGames.org website. Um, there are places you can go online to just see how other people have put together alternate reality games, etc. The next slide is just a picture of a puppet master team. This was the, specifically for the one, the contagion one that I described to you, where we brought people together from all over the country and Australia to come together in a um, event just so we could talk, you know, right in a room and, and put stuff up on paper and, and on pages. And it was a really exciting couple of days that we got together. Um, if you're creating an alternate reality learning experience, get together with the folks that you've uh, agreed to, whether it's by video or by chat or by fo phone call, and start to put some of those ideas down on paper. Get yourself to a place where you're ready to go. So now you've got your, your team assembled. Uh, you kind of understand the basics of game mechanics and, and leveling and, and some of those things around points and badges and, and, and stuff like that. The next phase is really important, and if you look at the next slide, it says to be outcomes to a narrative. This is crucial for education. Um, now, this is different than what you might see in a 
alternate reality game that is being played just as a game for the sake of being a game. In our case, you really want to identify the learning outcomes. Now, there's two ways to do that. You could start with the narrative and try to figure out outcomes that might come out of it, or you can start with the outcomes and then see if you can find a narrative that will allow you to play it. I've done it both ways. Both ways are equally as effective. But uh, if you look at the next slide, it suggests that a narrative really is at the heart of all good games. Really in the middle, that storyline really helps create setting and context and helps the activity push forward. So you want to make sure that you've got a strong narrative that includes lots of the things that narrative is supposed to include. Conflict, the creation of disequilibrium, the building of that disequilibrium, the tension over time. So when we played our Contagion game, we killed off hundreds of thousands of people every day in that game so that the, the students realized it was getting harder and harder and worse and worse and the, the, the earth you know, was coming to this, this really bad place for people. So you want to use the, the effective tools of narrative, but as the next slide shows, you also want to make sure that you've got your outcomes. You want to think about uh, global goals for sure, and that's what I've illustrated here. In that contagion game, we talked about basic health tenets, uh, cultural sensitivity, persuasion, but each class had local outcomes, specific outcomes. So again, our biology students in 10th grade, they've got certain things on, um, uh, when it comes to the scientific method that they really were supposed to learn that particular year. So the teachers made sure that they took that experience and kind of filtered it so that the scientific method was really how they viewed that experience. Our political science students, or in this case social studies students, had specific outcomes for social studies around uh, the Earth's history and government and how government worked. And so in those courses, they talked about the House versus the Senate. They talked about the you know, the multiple branches of government and how they work together or sometimes didn't work together. And so they really tried to use that as they went. In the case of the game we just played, if you look at the next slide, it shows you the learning outcomes that we had hoped to get you to start to uncover. Now, certainly, some of these things you may have already known. And in, if that's the case, then you, you come to the game with that in mind. But hopefully, there were some things you didn't know. Um, a, a lot of people said that they didn't know about schemata, that, that the word schema or scaffolding started as the word schemata, and it was essentially asserted by Dewey. Dewey was the one who really propagated that in the United States to go against the kinds of education that, that Wilson and those guys were trying to push. Um, hopefully you learned something about social learning. That's one of those terms that I hear it often described incorrectly. People just say, well, it's any time you learn a social setting. But as you now have seen, if you researched anything by Vygotsky or Piaget for that matter, that social learning is very different. Social learning is about how one peer literally teaches another peer. And the benefits to both people that come from that are really quite powerful. You may have learned about the zone of proximal development for the first time. That's something that has been used by gamers for a long time, but it's actually Vygotsky's concept and it tied right back into social learning. You may have learned something about the three guys that we've talked about already. You may have learned about social engineering, that Horace Mann, Elwood Coverley, Woodrow Wilson, Rockefeller, they wanted schools to be mills. They wanted that. They built them that way, just like the Prussian uh, government had done, so as to keep people in very distinct classes. And again, hopefully, that gave you the ability to start thinking about inputs versus outputs as we went. That's what we were trying to uh, get you to learn in this particular case. But if you look at the next slide, it's not just about the learning outcomes because it still is a game. So you have to have some game outcomes. You've got to think about good verbs just like you do with an outcome. You have to think about it with the game. What are you asking students to do when they play? To collect something, to find something, to, to fix it. In this case, we were asking you to find and then to curate and then to help me as I was trying to assemble this, this giant puzzle. And so the next slide kind of describes that. We wanted you doing these puzzles, these ciphers, trans, uh, translations of material. Some of you had never used Google Translator before, and then you saw 
that this Russian website could be translated by Google Translator. And so you tried it. And that was really fantastic when we started seeing people saying, hey, I, I looked at the granddaughter's blog and it said this, because we know the only way you could see that is if you actually translated or spoke Russian. And since I'm guessing most of you don't speak Russian, and since the Russian technically wasn't perfect, because we started in English, we translated it using Google so that you could translate it back correctly, um, I'm, I'm going to guess that it was the first thing that you learned how to use Google Translator, some of you. Um, we also wanted to get to some critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, research along the way. The game marrying the learning outcomes really does set up a nice platform for that. The next slides just show, so 34 shows a, a, a site that we used in one of the games that I played. Uh, the next slide shows some other apps that we used as inspiration for a game. This, this is called Plague. Really cool little app that uh, basically allows you to try to destroy the human race as we know it with your own plague that you can make up. It's quite clever. The next slide uh, is a Place to Escape app that shows you how to use those kinds of experiences to compel people. The next slide shows how to use a, and in this case it's a math riddle. Uh, you can start to embed these riddles inside of the games to see stuff. The next slide is one of my favorite pictures of all time. It is ultimate cipher. It is a cipher that uh, was created by an American artist named Jim Sanborn. It's at the CIA's headquarters. And only one third of it has ever been translated. Uh, it's been sitting there untranslated for decades, I think two decades. And in fact, uh, Jim Sanborn is getting nervous uh, because he's a cryptographer and he is nervous that he's going to die before the CIA students actually figure out the, the cipher that he created. So uh, they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. You can end these things in plain sight anywhere and then begin to use them and pepper your game with these different kinds of clues and riddles. The next slide is about step four, finding inspiration and then moving on through iteration to get you to a place where these games really take on a life of their own. Um, in the case of the game that we just played, uh, one, of the, one of the things that was really fun was starting to figure out who was the antagonist, who was the person who perpetuated the conflict. And we started talking about um, uh, some of the different kinds of entities we wanted grouped together. And then my team, some of the really clever folks on my team, came up with some of the names you heard. You know, Max New. And he, he was a publisher who sense publishing, so Max New Sense is really what we were trying to be cheeky with, you know, makes no, no sense. But if you look at the next slide, you can see where we started to put out some of those ideas. The education machine uh, had a Google Doc that went with it. And we let everybody who was part of the game in on the Google Doc so that they got to play. Um, uh, you know, a part in trying to create this narrative, create the, the ties to the outcomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as we went. So it was really a pretty uh, enjoyable experience for the game players. Now, in terms of the narrative, let me give you a narrative that really can take you on a, on a ride. And this is a true story. This actually happened. The next slide, slide 41, talks about uh, a shirt. There, what you're seeing there is a shirt from a Nine Inch Nails concert. And on this shirt, there was a clue. And nobody knew it was there. Nobody knew that there, that this clue existed. Uh, somebody got the shirt and noticed that some of the letters on the shirt were highlighted. Well, when they got home, they took the, the letters, they put them together, and then they typed them into Google to see what that would mean. It led them to the next slide. It led them to this web page, um, which actually was this strange uh, picture of all these this hand coming out of the sky. They didn't know what it what it was. They didn't know what it meant. They didn't know why it was there. It was just on this I am trying to believe.com website. But there was a place on this website that allowed you to download a new song from Nine Inch Nails. Uh, it was a hidden link. You had to actually find it over in the black area on the left, and then it would allow you to download a song. Well, the person who found it uploaded it to a fan site, and the people were excited, and they said, hey, where did you get this? Is this really them? Is it a cover band? And she said, no, I, I really found this, and she sent them back to this website, and it took on this interesting kind of life. The next slide was a YouTube video 
And I'm sorry, I, I thought I would be able to actually play a video. So it, you're not going to see it here. All you're going to see is black. But it's on, uh, it's on YouTube. If you look up Year Zero, you'll actually be able to see. It's a 30-second clip of this hand coming out of the sky on what looks to be a family trip uh, as a, a kid is shooting a, a, a recorder outside of a window. And the comments underneath that were crazy. What was that? Is it the hand coming out? out of the sky was at the hand of God I don't what was I seeing and people about every 25th 20 or 30th comment got directed back to I'm trying to name players by one of the puppet masters in this case their marketing firm and uh, they started to play the game without even being Nine Inch Nails fans at all the next slide shows what they started to do at their concerts so they got over to Holland over uh, to uh, Europe and they started putting USB drives on the back of toilets inside of their con their concerts. And people started picking them up and putting them in their computers when they got home and then finding there's Nine Inch Nail songs, which was unbelievably stupid in my opinion to do. Don't ever put a, an unknown USB drive in your, in your computer. But they did. And when they did that, this is the most miraculous part of this whole story to me. Somebody heard at the end of one of the Nine Inch Nail songs, the strange, it goes off into these crickets and it sounds like chainsaws in the background and all this stuff. And they put it through a spectrograph. I don't even know what a spectrograph actually is. But somebody had access to one and they took that and put it through it. And they found what you see on the next slide, which was the plot points of that spectrograph, which looks like a hand coming down out of the sky. And it matched exactly what was happening on the Nine Inch Nails album cover that was accidentally released the day that this showed up on the internet. Well, now people realized they were playing a game. The next slide shows you the websites that they then had to start people to communicate back and forth. They hadn't expected it to get so out of control that people needed these places to communicate, but it did. The next slide shows some of the weird evidence that they started sharing with people, um, these assets that they built that got people communicating about this, that, or the other. One of the assets asked people for their address. People gave it. About 10,000 people gave it, actually. And um, of those 10,000 people who gave their address, 1,000 of them reached what you see on the next slide. They received this in the mail. This tiny little kit that had inside of it a dead cell phone, had paraphernalia and pamphlets about the end of the world, about the climate change and all this. And then it had a sticky note on the cell phone that said, get to this place at this time in Hollywood, California in about three weeks. You'll be glad you did. Of the 1,000 people, over 900 showed up. The next slide shows, uh, and I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to see because I'm sure they all run together. Uh, people got to California. They got on buses that were blacked out, though the shades were, were all drawn, or they had garbage bags taped to the windows. You had to hand over your wallet and cell phone when you got on the bus. Everybody did. It drove them around for a long time to try to get them lost so that nobody knew where they were, and then finally dumped them out at a warehouse. They all get into this warehouse, and people start looking around, kind of wondering what's happening. And this guy comes out at the end of the warehouse and says, first of all, he says, Can you, why did you give us your cell phones and wallets? Nobody knows where you are. And everyone kind of uncomfortably laughs. You can actually see all of this on YouTube. It's, it's really quite clever. But then he talks for 20 minutes about the end of the world, about how governments are covering things up, and this, that, and the other. And then he walks off stage. And nobody knows what's happening. They think, is that it? Is that the end? Until finally, about... 20, 25 minutes after that, the stage lights up again. And if you look at the next slide, that's actually a picture of Nine Inch Nails singing their entire new album for this, this personal rock for these people who made it there. That is a pretty compelling narrative. It drew people in from all over the world, from Japan, from Brazil, from Amsterdam. People all over the world played this game and tried to get to California to be part of this because it was a big, big deal. The next slide suggests that you also then want to figure out how you're going to deliver your media, whether it's through uh, something local like a learning management system or you're going to use Google or Microsoft or some sort of uh, Apple or iOS thing. You can use mobile devices. You could use Facebook. Now, we tried to use, in this case, a lot of different things. The next slide shows you some of the sites that we started using. And in fact, some of these were new to me at the beginning of this game. I had never seen Padlet. I had never seen Tiki Taki and the Tiki Taki timelines. I wasn't nearly as familiar with Wikimedia Commons as uh, one of our, our designers, Cecilia Bolick, was. She, she talked about how we could put any picture there and we could annotate it and we could it, it, and it would look like a wiki, like a, a legitimate wiki. 
Now we also tried to use you know Google Translate and some geocaching with um, Google Maps. All of those are free. All of those have a free choice for putting up content and allowing people access to them. The next slide shows just other kind of ideas that I've used along the way in different games. But you can begin using any free, if you want, or you could do paid if there's a reason to do that, I guess, um, website out there to build these games together. The next slide shows the use of a learning management system for some of these things. Um, the next si slide shows that you can start to tie one game back to other games. I've, I've actually seen games where they do that, where a, a game gets so big that they start treating it like it's a part of reality. And so you can actually, actually begin to just figure out what your mode is for your game. And then uh, the next slide, we're almost done here. Figure out when your game is going to launch. When is the last date of the game going to be played? What are your milestones? You've got to figure out how fast or slow people can get to the end so that you can throttle the game. You can make it go faster. You can make it go slower. You can really help students along or slow them down if they're going too fast using injects. Uh, so in this case, with the alternate reality game that we just played, we released stuff along the way on Twitter and on the Padlet board as we found it or as you uncovered it. We made sure to put it up there so that everybody could see it as we went. We, we did a few of them slower than we thought. We did a few of them faster than we thought because we're sort of watching how the game was actually being played. Uh, the next slide talks about how we did that for the contagion exercise. You know, we said this contagion has, has killed 10,000 people in 96 hours. You do the math and figure out how long the world has before we're all gone. And that was basically the clock that we started ticking from day one of that semester for those students. The next slide suggests that you should kind of create your assets. So think of your videos, your character profiles, the clues, the riddles, the ciphers, the, the testimonies, anything that you're going to create. And you can see my next slide just kind of talks about maybe you have a uh, puppet master group at the top, a group of instructors next to that. You've got got student leaders and then student participants below that and you've got to communicate up and down that ladder all the time as you go uh, which will make it much much easier for you to get feedback and know how the game is being played now I've created the next slide shows the Facebook accounts that we built for those those uh, cheating students that I talked to you about the, the first slide is the uh, boy the second slide is a myspace page that's how long ago we played that game a myspace page of the girl uh, and we, we built those the slide after that shows you the actors, or in this case, my students, inside of the classroom trying that case. In fact, the, the next slide after that shows you all the different kinds of actors that we had. We had the journalists. We had the, um, the uh, forensic scientists. We had the prosecutor. In fact, the only person who participated in that class of 450 students that I had at UNC the only person who wasn't a student was a sitting bench judge. We had an actual judge sit bench and, and, and play with us. The next, side, the next slide is when you start the game. You call roll. You start to publicize it. You invite players to play. You invite classes to play. People start to get the word out. They start to say what's happening. Now, the slide after this talks about the, the groups that went to the contagion game. Again, science, political science, business, communications, medicine, health. We weren't sure they were all going to want to play. So we started asking the teachers, do you want to do this? And they said, yes, I can hook my students' outcomes in to your narrative this way uh, in that particular instance. But at the end of the day, we thought we were going to kill off of the 7.8 billion people on our planet. We thought that we were going to kill off about half of them. And we determined if they could beat it before we killed off half that they would win. And if they could um, not figure out the thing by the, that point, they would lose. Well, the next slide shows the last step, the epic win, exactly what they were able to do. So in, in essence, I have tried to share with you how to create an alternate game. That's how we put this one together that we just played. Uh, all of that information will stay up there on the Padlet site. In fact, all the stuff I shared with you, please go back and take a look at it. The stuff on Wikimedia Commons is amazing. The Tiki Talkie timeline is fantastic. It's this three-dimensional, really cool, um, you get to pull the items toward you. And, you know, we left this game open. We didn't give you the paper. We gave you an abstract of the paper. So if we wanted to, we could start this game up again, add on to it, and start to maybe now uncover the paper. 
it was hard enough for me to write a two-page paper as if I were Dewey, Piaget, and Vygotsky. Unfortunately, that's not real. But um, trying to write probably three years' worth of work would be, what, a 95-page document? I don't know if I have that in me. Maybe. So uh, maybe someday you'll get invited to the next round of this. But in the meantime, that's how you build an alternate reality game. I've got a couple of minutes here at the end. I was going to leave them open for questions. Um, Mitch, I think if someone raises their hand, you want to bring them up, and then uh, they can talk and ask questions. So please. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off while people are um, thinking about raising their hands. Uh, how? Um, what's your next step? I mean, what you're, you're doing a political game at uh, St. Leo University. What other, what other types of things are you planning? Well, um, that, I'll tell you, that game is taking up a, a bit of our time. It happens in two weeks. It's actually uh, two weeks from tomorrow. We have coming to that final debate. It's the two presidential candidates. We have invited NPR and Fox News and uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, the local affiliates in Tampa. Uh, we have invited all of the current presidential hopefuls. Uh, we have invited, um, gosh, uh, local politicians. So we've got a state senator who's coming and a state representative who is for RSVPDS. So it's a big deal for us. So really, over the next two weeks, I'm going to be focused pretty myopically on that. But after that, we hope to play some games at some conferences and bring these sorts of experiences to some others for professional development uh, as we go. Mm -hmm. And um, have, you, have you seen these types of games used in, in high schools or middle schools or even elementary schools? Yeah, so World of Classcraft is a pretty good example. Now, that really is heavily dependent on video, uh, uh, it's like Warcraft really. But uh, I'll say the reason I like alternate reality games that are not video dependent is because you don't have to know how to code, you don't have to know how to program, you have a lot more control as a teacher. And since we've been, you know, I, I've been sharing this concept with high school teachers for a long time, uh, a number of them have really taken the ball and run and built their own very clever little games that they share with me. Um, over time, I, I don't know, I've probably seen a dozen or, or so that have really been pretty successful. Yeah, I, uh, Paul uh, Darvis was going to be helping us with this game, and then he, he ran into a lot of work at school. But he did a, he did an incredible one with, with his uh, – uh, the, the kids all of a sudden found that their identities had been hacked. And yeah. there was some organization that was, um, that was trying to destroy the, their identities, and they had to find the organization. And about halfway in the game, they found out that there was, that there was another group that was also – um, trying to crack this case, and whoever won would, would be able to destroy the identities of the other class. So it turns out that there was a game in Philadelphia, and there's there, there's a group in Philadelphia, and there was a group in Canada that had to find where where each other was. And one of the um, kids in Canada, or the other kids in Philadelphia, um, by mistake, posted a picture of himself with a street sign. Um, and so they were able to figure out where the other school was. I see there's a question here. Um, so, you know, I'm going to bring myself down and um, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Marion up. So, so okay. she, maybe she can ask a question. One second. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. I was just actually trying to give uh, credit to John Fallon, who was the other part of that team, and is also doing a lot of this, um, a lot of this work. And uh, I just think it's really important that we, as we come together, that we find out who's doing this stuff so that we can pick their brains. That's it. That was really interesting. Uh, thank, thank you for all your work. That was um, Marion, and she's actually in New Zealand right now, listening to us. Brilliant. So we have a yeah, we have an international audience, and she was she was bringing up the fact that it wasn't uh, it wasn't just uh, Paul Darasi. The other teacher who was involved was a person named John Fallon, uh, who also was was uh, part of our group, uh, you know, in in putting together this game a little bit, uh, yeah. and he's in Connecticut. So she wanted to make sure that they both got credit. Uh, but you know something, I'm not. Oh, no, perfect. I'm not going to give John Fallon credit at all. I think that he had nothing to do with it. I think it was just Paul Darvassi. So, <laughs> I, mean, I, I actually met John about a week ago, and I told him it was odd to get a, a, an email from John Fallon, who's also the, the CEO of Pearson. 
<laughs> right. And I, I right. didn't. Yes. Yeah. It was. It was an odd coincidence. John Fallon. Yep. Right. Right. Okay. So. Um, oh, that's right. And 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 I get Tyler had a question, but it wasn't really a question. He was just saying that he could he could hear Marion. Um, so. Oh, somebody. Yes, Chris Davis is there. Okay. So Chris, now it's you and me. Um, so oh. and and I guess you did post your question, um, but. So you're saying? Yeah, um, I was. I was. Really, I was um, curious about you know, I, I see a lot of planning going into this idea of the puppet team creating the game, and then mm -hmm. I know Paul Dorvasi talked a lot about his students taking over the game, like actually hacking the control of the game and then steering it from there. Wow. And I was wondering cool. if, if he played around with that kind of design of having students design the trajectory of the game or even be the game designers themselves. Okay, so I'm hoping that he saw you. I'm going to bring you down and uh, bring uh, Jeff back up. And if he didn't hear it, then I'll, then I'll be able to tell him. Okay, you're back up. Did you did you hear the question? Yeah, I didn't. I saw him come up, but I couldn't hear anything. Okay, so so okay. what what he was saying is that uh, in when Paul uh, and John Fallon created their question, some of them actually hacked into the game and kind of took control of it. Have you? Mm -hmm. Had that happen, or have you planned for anything like that happening in, in any of your games? Yeah, so we uh, when we did this in person with the students that were playing the communication event, uh, the second year that I tried it at the University of North Colorado, we had we knew, we knew whether the person had done it or not, and we had uh, a file for it, and we found out that the teaching assistant to the other one of the other professors had gotten in and found that file. And then got the information out, leaked the information, and uh, kind of ruined the game. So like that down, just had it in conversation form. But we talked about whether that would happen during the contagion event, and we made sure that we had um, kind of hack-proof sites so that they couldn't. Uh, I realized in some situations you may be stuck with you know a free option that hack-proof. You don't have control over it, yep. and if that's the case, uh -huh. then I would just prepare for the contingency. Okay. Um, so let me just see if there's um, uh, right. So so I don't think that there's that there's other questions right now. Um, I'm thinking that uh, you know using basically the same assets that you've put together here, that maybe this winter we can just run this exact same game again, um, or do a few wrinkles on it. But you know you don't have to write uh, 90 pages in um, in French and Russian, yeah. uh, but base, you know, putting a few more wrinkles or different wrinkles into this game, but run this game again and invite more people to play. Um, yeah, we actually talked about doing this maybe for some professional development with, we have pretty good relationships in Florida, at least with the, the Pasco County and some of the other County, uh, teachers and maybe trying to run some PD through, you know, a game for our teachers, at least locally, we would love to consider doing it. Now. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, you had some information yeah. that I just flashed up for a minute. I'm going to bring myself down so that uh, people know how to get in, in contact with you. And the other thing is those slides that you put up, uh, when we post the archive of the video, I'll also post a link to those slides so that people can ha have access to those as well. Um, so let me, cool. let me pull up that last slide for you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, while he's doing that, I see one other game, one other question down there in the question section. Any suggestions for games that could be played by a mass of people at conferences or workshops? Um, it's funny, the cheating game that, that we did at a conference, it was developed for a conference, and I then delivered it at a retreat for teachers, for uh, high school teachers, a uh, couple of years after that. Basically what I did was I, I found this cool little bomb clock thing. Uh, it was hard to get through. TSA, believe it or not, when I was trying to travel with it, but um, I was able to take it to this conference, and basically I said I, I had hacked in, I, I came on as I morphed my voice, and I came on and I said, I've hacked your school's SIS system, uh, I'm going to release all the grades that, that have, have been given out for all these years, I'm going to delete them, um, if you don't fix what happened, and so I just sort of turned it on, it on its head a little bit, and said, you have to figure out who cheated, because one of these students was innocent and you accused them, but you kicked them both out of school. And so uh, we played the game over the course of a weekend and I literally used some of the Nine Inch Nails tricks. I put USB drives in certain places. I had 
physical clues in addition to all the virtual clues like we played here. Um, I think almost any alternate reality game can be played in a mixed reality setting. You just have to take some of the clues and make them physical. So with that said, um, Mitch has put up uh, the information about how to get in touch with me. Please do. I would love you. Uh, thanks so much for playing this little game with us. And yeah, I really I, appreciate I, it. I, I, yeah, and just one more thing is that we did put in a, a, um, uh, a request for South by Southwest EDU uh, that we create a, um, an alternative reality game for them. We haven't heard back from them, so we don't know if they're going to choose us. But we're, we're hopeful. But maybe if some of you listening can um, contact South by, South by Southwest CDU and say, we want to play uh, Jeff and Mitch's game, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe we'll be selected. Uh, but Jeff, well, thanks a lot. I, I think this is really cool. And um, I, I'll just say uh, good night for, for EdgeHead Interactive. We have two events next week. Um, both of them look really interesting. We're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Russ Qualia uh, talking about teacher voice. And then we're going to be uh, we we're going to be having another session. I think on the fourth on Minecraft. If you go to www.edgechatinteractive.org, you can find both uh, both sessions next week. Um, so this is uh, Mitch Weisberg. I'm uh, I'll, I'll say good night, Jeff. Take care. Thanks so much. Good night. <laughs>